Californians just raised their gas tax today and are giving free health care only to illegal immigrants. Congrats for being complete suckers, California voters. Now, I want to talk about that and this. This is a Venezuela timeline. 1992 became third richest country in hemisphere. 1997 became second largest purchaser of F-150. 2001 voted for socialist president income inequality. 2004, private health care is completely socialized. 2007, all higher education becomes free. 2009, socialists ban private ownership of guns. 2012, Bernie Sanders praises their American dream. 2014, opposition leaders are in prison. 2016, food health care shortages become widespread. 2017, constitutions and elections are suspended. 2019, unarmed citizens massacred by own government. It only took one generation of progressive leadership to plunge this country into civil war and complete dictatorship. Intellectuals ruin everything. I'm not talking about scientists, tinkers, and entrepreneurs that create amazing breakthroughs. Right? Most of those people were, did so outside of the established intelligentsia. Like Einstein was a patent office clerk. Well, he was thinking in his spare time about relativity and e equals mc squared, etc. And then only later on was he accepted when he basically changed the world in physics forever. The same is true uh, of the Wright brothers. The Smithsonian refused to even put a Wright Brothers plane in the museum. And they used some BS concocted by uh, somebody hired by the government that didn't even fly. Flew for like 10 seconds and then broke. For years, they refused to accept and showcase that the Wright Brothers actually were the first to fly. Because they were just bicycle mechanics. Two brothers that argued all the time. And then they had a sister who was actually really good at math. Just an interesting plot twist. And they just tried stuff and tried stuff and tried stuff. They debated, they argued, they tried things, and they eventually figured it out. That's how most things happen. Penicillin was an accident. It was a Petri dish left on the counter over the weekend. And he comes back and finds it. He's like, oh, what is this thing? And then we discover penicillin. There's so many examples of this throughout history. People think that colleges and the research departments and professors and these people that have tenure that can just all day sit around thinking about stuff. I got to say, there is a difference between research scientists psychologists and research that way, like behavior, behavioral economics, things like that. And then typical in the world of ideas where those are kind of fiat economists or sociologists or people like that, where they read books and studies and research and this kind of stuff. And then they use that data to come up with some idea, most of which is about whether it sounds good in their mind or whether it's going to get them funding or whatever. Then they go out and they parrot that and they try to get the world to believe it. They're not out there living in the trenches, trying these things, seeing if they work. They're not performing actual experiments. They're not observing humans up close and personal. They're just reading papers and books of, of which you can cherry pick. Like you can literally read one book or not read another. It's very easy to do. <laughs> Thomas Sowell's talked about this a lot. He's been critical of intellectuals for years. He's talked about how they pretty much ruin everything because they influence policy. And then policy makers and Washington, et cetera, create these programs. Then they cherry pick the data of whether the stuff even worked or not. Most of the time it doesn't work. Most of the time it makes it worse. I'm telling you, I can't believe this is the case, but if you read Sowell or if you read into some of the history of these things, most of the time government does something, whether it is Planned Parenthood or sex education in schools, vaccines even. When you look at the history and the actual data and you don't cherry pick it, government usually makes things worse and also at the same time try to take credit for something that they didn't do. For example, all these deaths from these diseases that vaccines supposedly cured well, they were on a major decline well before vaccines were widespread. Yet everybody tries to point to vaccines being the reason. No, we know that sanitation and proper nutrition was the reason. Vaccines take all the credit. The induction of sex education happened at a time when there were declining abortions, declining pregnancies out of wedlock and teenage mothers, et cetera. These numbers were declining. And then guess what? This is, a, this is an interesting one. Upon the introduction of widespread sex education, those numbers reversed. There were more abortions. There were more teenage pregnancies. There were more examples of sexually transmitted diseases, etc. There are countless examples of this. When the government gets involved in something, they make it worse. Now, I've thought about a lot why that is. I know why that is. It's hard to explain why that is. It's very simple. If we were to break it down into a too long didn't read or too long didn't study nutshell, this is what it would be. Government doesn't have skin in the game. Individuals in government don't have skin in the game. They are protected from the outcome of their policies. Okay, skin in the game just means that I have something to lose. When you make decisions about your own finances, your own life, your own safety, when you make decisions for you and your family, somebody you care about, the decisions you make are diametrically, usually diametrically opposed to the decisions you make when you're spending somebody else's money 
sending someone else's kids into war, so on and so forth. This is why government fails. This is why corporations, when they're tasked with a problem that government used to do, always perform better because they will go out of business. They will lose market share. Unhappy customers, ineffective products will fail in the marketplace. This is why the market always creates everything. This is why tinkerers and entrepreneurs and innovators are always outside of some established system that has these weird norms and these weird biases and these things that keep it so that you can't actually experiment. You can't see what doesn't work because that's expensive or because you're not going to get funding for it or whatever. If you were to come out and say climate change is pretty much a hoax, we don't even know if, it, if humans caused it or not, and you're a climate researcher, the government doesn't give you money anymore. It's like a very simple incentive aligned structure. So what do you do? You keep publishing data talking about how humans are destroying climate so that they'll keep giving you money to sit in a room and read research papers and write your books and whatever. It's, it's all a freaking racket. Like I said, there are so many examples of this, but the core fundamental reason that the state doesn't work and that it always leads to really bad outcomes is because the people making the decisions don't have real skin in the game. They have nothing to lose. They get paid either way. There's some loose connection between their policies working or not working and people like voting another way, but most people aren't paying attention enough. And these things take so long and they're so complicated. And you have the mainstream media, which helps protect them because they come up with these convenient narratives about, oh, that didn't work. Literally look at COVID. The government spent an estimated like $3.7 trillion to fight COVID. What the hell difference did they make? What did they do? And you want to know what all the experts would say that prop up this broken narrative? They would say, well, it would, would have been way worse. It's a freaking racket. It's a joke. It's all connected. You have to have a very broad understanding of a lot of these things. You have to understand how like freedom of speech and gun rights and all these things, how they're all connected, how they're all foundational principles. It's really hard to be a first principles thinker. Most people are not. They are sheep. They think what is convenient and they ignore what is not. If it's inconvenient to have a political view or an idea or whatever, even to ask a question in a lot of cases, and that threatens your job, or your relationship, or your friends liking you, or including you in the in-group or whatever, most people will simply not say something and they will over time change their opinions or just completely suppress them to which it's the same thing as changing them. If it just eventually forget about them because it's more convenient. This is the average human person. This is why politics has become such a polarized two-party thing. It's us first them, it's black versus white, et cetera. Those pulling the strings at the top love it when the public is going at each other. They love the two-party system because the united people would just completely demolish them. So divide and conquer, very simple. Divide, which weakens your opponent. I mean, by about 50%, I mean, take an opponent and cut it in half. That's basically what you get with divide and conquer. Pretty good strategy. I'll leave you with another core big idea here. Maybe two. The one core idea is that the state can never do anything effectively. The state is a misallocation of resources. The state is basically a mafia that pretends it's a human rights organization, as Dave Smith has said. It puts you at the point of a gun and says, you must pay your taxes, you must do this, you must do that. And if you don't, you go to jail. That's violence. Everything we do in this country that is beholden to the government in some way is through violence. Violence, threat of violence, same thing. Most people will take this as a given. Most people think governments just have to exist. It is what it is, blah, 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 blah. They don't understand history. And in the future, over time, we will see these things. These things will come and they will go. We will have new modes of organizing. I'm hoping Bitcoin is essential to that. It's gonna completely change human interaction for the better, I believe. Don't accept government as something that must be there just because it's been there your whole life. Because there are periods of time throughout history when there was no government or a government had just toppled and it was basically anarchy. There are places around the world that govern themselves, peacefully, mind you, constructively, mind you. There are examples, you can find the data here. So the one big idea is more government is never better. More laws and regulations are never better. What you actually want is less government. You want the minimalist, you want the smallest government possible. You want the government that will basically be there just to protect personal property rights. You're right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Whatever that means for you, as long as someone else doesn't infringe on any of that, you're good to go. And that includes murder. That includes rape. That includes theft. Those are your ultimate property rights. And that's all government should be involved in. The second big idea is you must become your own sovereign human. You must protect yourself and the family. If you rely on the government, if you rely on supply chains, if you rely on things that can at the whim of some politician, can be gone one day, be outlawed the next day, whatever. 
if you rely on these things, if you are fragile to these things, over a long enough period of time, you will pay consequence for them. You will suffer as a result. Now, the very simple way to do this is to have your passports, maybe have some silver, some physical resources, have your Bitcoin, have maybe a destination, a place of where you would go to ride out the storm, have an exit plan, and then sleep well at night. That's my strategy. That's what I recommend. When you do that, it's the ultimate insurance policy. You don't have to worry about what they're actually doing because you will be aware of what they're doing. And at the first sign of craziness, you'll get out, you'll leave. And then you'll go watch maybe from a beach somewhere. And then here's a tweet that I thought was worth reading out loud. Last night, I saw a former colleague who is Republican. She recently had drinks with her progressive friend. He is leaving San Francisco for Florida. She told him, progressives don't want to live in the policies they create. He replied, seriously, I had not thought of that. <laughs> and it's like, good on that that dude for not trying to defend it or whatever. Like, good on him for just kind of saying, hmm, interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. But this is like the average person. They don't understand the ramifications of voting for insane policies and that how that it might come back to bite them. It might come back to make your standard of living garbage. It might result in you paying more taxes, et cetera, so on and so forth. And California's a perfect example. More state, more state, more state, more virtue signaling, more liberal nonsense. And then, I mean, California is a failed state. If California wasn't continually bailed out by the government and given free money, it wouldn't exist. There'd be no funds to do anything. And it's literally a shit show anyways. Like who, like, why do you want to live there? It's crazy. It's crazy that so many people still live there.